our uh, third service of this kind uh, on over Zoom. Um, I think they've been going okay so far. So it's, obviously, it's not the same as all being together, but it's uh, it's great that we can still be meeting like this. To read uh, Psalm 8, it's a, a beautiful morning. I know that not everybody's got a, a garden necessarily to be able to enjoy it, and a lot of us are people are frustrated, stuck indoors. Uh, but it is a, a beautiful morning, and uh, let me uh, read Psalm 8. It reminds us of uh, the glory of uh, God's creation and, uh, and our place uh, within it. Psalm 8. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And here we've got this glorious creator God who uh, sets his glory in the heavens. Uh, and yet he makes us as those who, who rule over it, gives us this, uh, this uh, very uh, honoured position and uh, made him uh, lower than the heavenly beings and yet crowned uh, with glory uh, and honour. And uh, gives us this calling to rule over his creation and on a day like this we can give thanks and praise for that wonderful creation where we have the opportunity maybe uh, later on this afternoon and uh, this uh, our opening song i don't know if i know, I know matt's still fielding people trying to sign in and things whether we'll be able to do the song or not but uh, our first song is going to be uh, a little bit about our creation as well calling uh, praise the lord the almighty the king of creation and uh, i'm just i don't know if matt's going to be there we go that's, there we go, Matt's got it. Uh, but wait, I've not started. I don't know how to get out of this to find the song now. Here we go. Okay, so do, uh, as ever, uh, I'm, the only reason I'm not singing is because I'm the only person not on mute. Um, but do sing along is you're, if you're able and uh, you are muted, so don't worry if you feel shy. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's sing together. Uh, even though we can't to meet normally, we can still... Uh, praise our God together. So this is praise the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. so Please. 
So I'm not sure what happened with the words of that one, but uh, great song, even just listen to. I've got doorbells going on. I think every time somebody signs in, they're not on mute, so just, we just get the, the sound for a little bit. Uh, let me just uh, mention a few notices. Now, I'm sure I'm going to forget something, but uh, just uh, bear with me. So um, uh, one thing to mention on uh, this coming Friday, we're going to be having a Good Friday service, and uh, I'm pretty sure we said that that. 10 30 i should check the notice myself i think it's 10 30 having a good friday service uh, frank is going to be speaking at that and I'm, i'll be uh, leading it and uh, normally on good friday we would do communion together um, but we uh, well we are going to attempt to do it kind of via this medium so if you do have some some juice uh, and some bread uh, then you can join in with that and we can take communion at the it's the first time for me as well trying to do this but uh, we can see how it goes uh, trying to do take communion together uh, which would be a really great thing to be able to do on, on Good Friday. So this uh, coming Friday, and uh, I'm pretty sure it's 10.30. Uh, so you can wave at me if I've, if I've got that wrong. Uh, other thing to mention is, uh, I've been told there's no, despite the uh, announcement, there isn't a 16 to 18s group this week. So there's no 16 to 18s group that's happening every other week. So it won't be happening uh, this week, 16 to 18s uh, on, the, on the Wednesday. And also, uh, or last week for our wednesday bible study there wasn't a, a huge uh, turnout it was just uh, two of us so uh, and the other person there could could come on choosing that anyway so we are going to just scrap the wednesday group wednesday daytime group uh, if if you can't possibly make tuesday night and you would like to be to, to carry on be able to meet in a week do let me know and we can see if maybe there's another time uh, that more people might uh, like to to meet on i think it would be personally I think it would be good to have a few smaller groups rather than one massive group on the Tuesday uh, but anyway but it seemed to go right we did discipleship explored uh, this course we started on on Tuesday that seemed to go uh, seemed to be good a good engaging course going through Philippians taking our children's slot if we, if we just need here to now? maybe yeah I can hear you Cool, excellent. Sorry, I'll just switch computers. Uh, first right. of all, apologies for that last song. Uh, I think me and Adam need to coordinate words with oh. music. <laughs> so I have totally Sorry. different words for some of the verses. Um, okay. Yeah, so, and also, just in, in people appearing, it's nice to see um, Cicelyn on. Saw so a brief video of Cicelyn that Diane's obviously got up um, and then hidden again, but that's fine, but lovely to see you, Cicelyn. Uh, it's been a long time. So children's spot. So I'm going to um, share some pictures on screen. I'm hoping there's some children online. I can see one at least popping around between his parents there. Uh, I'm hoping some more are going to appear because I need your input here because the adults may not know the answers. Uh, I'm going to show you some pictures and I want to know whether the people I am sh showing on screen are heroes or villains. So let's hope this is going to work. So here's the first one. Who is, first of all, who is this person? You might need to come off mute. Uh, if you see your fingers waving Graham. around the screen. Who is this? Groo. Groo. Okay, Groo. Groo, even. Groo. And is Groo a hero or a villain, would we think? No. No. Both. Both. Yeah. A bit of both. Okay, yeah, fair enough. He, he starts off as a bit of a villain. But he turns all right in the end once he adopts those lovely little children and it becomes a, a big softy really, doesn't he? Okay, what about this one? Let's see if I can move on. 
What about this one? Hero or villain? Hero. 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 Yeah, everyone knows Superman is a bit of a hero, isn't he? And what about this one? Villain. Villain. Who is this? Darth Vader. Darth Vader, yeah, he's the baddie in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Star Wars. I know about Star Wars. Uh, what well, this might be a slightly controversial one. Hero or villain? I'm expecting Keith to fight I saw a girl in the bed, Daddy. Who is this, first of all? Who is it? Aguero. Aguero, Sergio Aguero. Oh. Now, I'm here now. I'm here now. It's definitely a hero. So, if you're sissy, he's going to be a hero. If he's united, he's going to be a villain. Ah, what about this this girl, this young girl? Who's this? A girl. It's a girl. Anyone know who this is? Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg. So. Hero or villain? Hero. 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 Yeah, a lot of people think she's a hero for her stand it. against climate change and the way in which she's fought against so many uh, politicians. Uh, so she's often thought she's a hero. What about these people? Heroes. The NHS, Hero. at the moment. Hero. Uh, we all need to stay home and help them, and they are they are heroes, and we celebrate them. Uh, well, the government says, what class? Any chefs? Any chefs? Pop back on mute. Adam, you're also a co-host, if you wouldn't mind just popping people uh, on. Okay. That would be great. Um, yeah, so the NHS, they're often considered our heroes at the moment, aren't they? Because of the work that they're doing. And uh, we often judge people by, by what they do. Uh, and we think of them uh, as heroes or villains, potentially. Uh, by what they do and some people at some point they might seem like a hero and some point they might seem like a villain like Gru for example in the start of the story in the film he starts off as a, as a villain but ends up being a bit of more of like a hero uh, helping out and doing things for good okay. and so at some point we sometimes think of people in different ways but what about Jesus I wonder today is traditionally known as Palm Sunday in the church and uh, Palm Sunday is a time when we remember uh, Jesus making a, making a specific journey. And one day we remember that story uh, as he heads towards Jerusalem. And this is a picture of one of the places, a modern day picture of one of the places he was headed towards, Bethany and Bethphage. And he tells his disciples to go ahead of him and to get a mm -hmm. colt. Oh, my head's in the way. He goes, tells his disciples to go and get a colt, a donkey that's never been ridden and to bring it to him. And then as he comes towards Jerusalem, we see the crowds uh, cheer him and they line the streets with, with their cloaks and they wave palm, palm branches and they shout uh, at Jesus. They shout, um, Hosanna, uh, here, here he comes. I've lost the words now. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest and they, they wave these palm branches and they celebrate him coming uh, in, in towards Jerusalem. And it's almost like he, he's their hero at this point. Uh, just like uh, football teams or other sports teams, perhaps when they've, they've won a competition, they get a great celebration. They get uh, perhaps an open top bus parade and people line the streets and wave flags and shout things at them and celebrate. And this was a bit like what it was like for Jesus as they waved their palm branches as they shouted as they threw their cloaks down and so they almost treated Jesus as a bit of a hero but only a few days later perhaps some of the same people shouted again but instead they shouted something different they shouted crucify 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 as Pilate washed his hands of Jesus and as Jesus was nailed to this cross more like the villains who were on his right and then his left. I can point towards them. Uh, uh, like the, he was treated more like these two criminals that were next to him. And so it wasn't so much a victory that it was looking like now. It looked much more like Jesus was being treated as a villain. But as we move towards 
uh, this Easter week, uh, we can consider Jesus as a hero in a different way. He was the hero of our salvation because he was the one that took, vic took victory uh, over sin and over death when he died and rose again. Jesus made a deliberate journey towards Jerusalem, knowing what was ahead of him. And because of that, we can know what is ahead of us. And in, perhaps in this time of slight uncertainty, uh, when people are, are wondering where they can find hope, we can be certain of our future in, because of what Jesus has done, because of his victory on the cross. And that, vic that uh, certainty of our future gives us the choice of either that future being life or death. If we accept Jesus' victory on the cross, it leads us to life because we receive the forgiveness that he offers and we get a fresh start and we've got a glorious future ahead of us as part of his kingdom for eternity. But if we, if we don't accept that victory, then we reject that offer of forgiveness uh, which, and our sins continue to separate us from God and from his love. It's a permanent separation that can only lead uh, to death. And so as we come to this what's traditionally known as Holy Week in, in the life of uh, traditional churches, let's consider this journey that Jesus took and choose to follow the hero of our salvation, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, as uh, the people shouted. That's what I encourage you to remember this week as we move towards this time of Easter. And I'll, I'll just hand back to Adam now. Great, thanks uh, Matt. Uh, a wonderful reminder of this, of course, the start of Holy Week. So I mentioned we're having our, our service on, on Friday and uh, next Sunday we will be, uh, it'll be Easter Sunday and we'll be thinking, of course, about uh, the resurrection of Christ and the life that we can have in him and uh, that great message of, of Easter. Uh, but uh, this week we actually, well, we're going to be thinking more on the topic of prayer than, rather than particularly at the events of Easter, although they, they will uh, come up as they're always relevant. Uh, but uh, we're going to be thinking, we, we, we had a series of, 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 on prayer due for the evening meetings, but we've kind of moved it to the uh, mornings just uh, to help us uh, think through at this time, maybe when we, we feel drawn to prayer and we want to pray uh, to, uh, to, hang on, there we go, uh, to, to, yeah, to get us focused on prayer. And uh, what we're looking at really is great prayers of the Bible and looking at some of the prayers in the Bible and what we can learn from them. So this week it's uh, Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. And uh, I'm going to read uh, the first uh, 23 verses of that chapter. Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to be uh, reading from the, the NIV. Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O oh Lord, we and our kings, our princes and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers, for I bring upon us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. And just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us. 
yet we have not sought the favour of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favour on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, listen. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hear and act. For your sake, O my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. I'm going to stop there. It's the passage we're going to be thinking about, that uh, prayer of uh, Daniel in a moment and what we can learn from it. Uh, before that, I'm actually going to uh, pray uh, myself. So let's, uh, let's draw near to this great God together and uh, we'll uh, draw near to him now. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, at a time when uh, many people's perhaps traditional confidences and assurances uh, are, are falling away, at a time of great anxiety and uncertainty, Lord, we praise you as the God who doesn't change. We praise you as the God who knows all things. You know every leaf that falls, every flower that opens at this time of year, and you know every virus. You know the end from the beginning. We thank you that you promise in your word to provide for our needs and that we don't need to worry or to be anxious. We praise you that in Christ there is a hope, even in the face of death. And as we likely in the coming weeks and months likely hear of more deaths from this virus, we thank you that in Christ death has lost its sting, that death has been defeated at the cross and we thank you for this time of year of uh, holy week as we've been reminded when we uh, think of uh, of that great sacrifice that was made for us to give us that hope in the face of death and lord help us to to look to that ultimate hope to cling to it to find joy in it help us to delight in you and not in all the unstable things of of our world but Lord, we do want to pray into this uh, situation with coronavirus. We, we do pray for an end to it. We pray that a, a vaccine would be developed quickly and, uh, and speedily. We pray that the current lockdowns around the world, that they would do their job in, in slowing the spread of this deadly disease. disease. We also want to think of the many working in healthcare at this time, even those within our own congregation. Lord, we pray that you would keep them safe, pray that you keep them strong, and we pray that you would help them as they help so many of us. We want to pray for those directly affected uh, by this virus in more serious ways, perhaps those are, who are worried for loved ones, those who maybe have loved ones who are ill, or even who have passed away, uh, maybe might, might come. I pray for those that are facing perhaps a financial cliff edge because of the lockdown. I pray for those for whom isolation has been incredibly hard for whatever reason. Again, Father, we do pray that you would fill us with a, a knowledge of your presence, of your love, your goodness. I pray that you would provide for our 
practical needs, our needs of food, of shelter, of clothing, but also our needs of companionship, fellowship, friendship. Well, we do thank you for the so many that I've spoken to and perhaps many of us have, have heard about who have been provided for in, in wonderful ways already. And Lord, we do want to keep praying into the many opportunities that this uh, unusual time is bringing about. Opportunities for perhaps reconnecting with family and friends that maybe we've drifted from. Opportunities with neighbours, perhaps, as we seek to support one another. Opportunities to engage with people about big questions of life and death. Lord, we pray for open doors for the gospel of hope in these troubled times. And help us, Lord, to speak when those opportunities come. Give us the words to say, to speak faithfully and clearly. And we pray all this in the name, almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, just as I was uh, praying, I was reminded, actually, one of the things that we uh, mentioned uh, in, a, in a meeting earlier in the week was it would be good to hear from other people about some of the ways that the Lord has been providing for our, our needs in the midst of all of this. That This is a difficult time. And often it's in difficult times when we, we see the Lord's goodness in those really surprising and amazing ways. And so if you do have uh, particular things that you'd like to share do uh, email them in and uh, or, or just message me or whatever and uh, if there are just a few not i'm not talking about big long things but if there's just a few little uh, ways that you've seen god's goodness in the midst of this it'd be great to be able for me to be able to read them out perhaps uh, in uh, future services so just to encourage us all uh, of the lord's goodness in the midst of that so if you did want to uh, message something in then uh, do uh, do do that we're going to pray, uh, not sorry, we're going to sing, sorry, not pray, pray uh, sing uh, again. Uh, this time you're the word of God, the Father. And uh, I'll just uh, give Matt a moment to get that one up. There we go. And let's uh, hope that the words that match up this time. Let's sing together. You're the word of God, the Father.
Great, thanks for that, uh, Matt. Uh, well, so we're going to be looking at this passage then in uh, Daniel 9 uh, now. Uh, and uh, I've titled this sermon, Praying with Promise. Uh, we don't have... Uh, we don't have the, the handouts hand to give out or PowerPoints, but uh, Matt has uh, put on the email a PDF, uh, just a little outline there to follow along if you if you want. Um, and I'll try and do that every every week, uh, just so it might help people to follow. And uh, let me pray for us as we open up this passage together. Lord, we thank you that uh, the Word of God, uh, that you are the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God embodied. And we thank you that we have uh, the Word of God in our hands, that we can hear from you that you you are a speaking god and i do pray that we would hear you at this time that uh, as we think about this great prayer of daniel that we would see uh, what it might mean for us and our own prayer lives as well and what it might mean for who you are and uh, your goodness to your people and we pray in the name of jesus amen amen we'll do have that uh, passage open in uh, daniel 9 uh, as i uh, said uh, whilst this uh, whilst our evening service are on hold, we've moved this uh, series on prayer to the mornings. So we'll have a little break for it next week, but we'll be back on it after that. And uh, and uh, we had, uh, yeah, so we had it planned for the evening and now we're doing it now. Because, of course, we need to be praying at a, a time like this, don't we? And uh, many people perhaps have got more time to pray than ever before, although speaking to a lot of people, they seem to be more busy than ever perhaps at the moment. But perhaps some people have got a bit more time to pray but perhaps nearly everybody's got a little bit more inclination to pray as perhaps some of our false confidences, we might call them, as they begin to fail us. And uh, perhaps the situation, we don't know what's going to come, but uh, we might be uh, pushed to prayer as uh, things get to harder uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and so maybe we are finding ourselves drawn to prayer at the moment. But of course, a common question, uh, particularly from new believers, is well, well, how do we pray? And of course, even as we go on in our Christian lives, we can easily get kind of stuck in a rut uh, in our prayers, we end up just kind of repeating the same things over and over again. Or perhaps, if we're honest, we begin to neglect prayer. And so as we look at these uh, great prayers from Scripture, uh, the hope is that they're going to inform uh, and fuel our, our own prayer lives and, and give a, a richness uh, to them. And, uh, and I said this week we were in Daniel 9. And this is a classic prayer from Daniel, this great uh, man of faith. And it really helps us to see what does God-centered prayer uh, look like. And uh, as we dig into this prayer this, this morning, I want us to see three things about prayer. Firstly, that we can pray with promise, that we pray with humility, and finally, that we can pray with confidence. So let's start with that first one, praying with uh, promise. We need to understand a little bit of the background to this prayer, just as we get stuck into it. The chapter starts by telling us uh, when we are in history, and it's a fairly turbulent time. It's the, we're told it's the first year of King Darius, the son of Xerxes, or your translation might say Ahasuerus, or something like that, so depending on what your translation is. Now, that might not mean a lot to you, but if you're familiar with the book of Daniel and some of the history, You'll know Daniel is a, a Jew who uh, around two and a half thousand years ago, he was taken captive from his home in Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And he was taken to the city of Babylon. And he's been, by this point in the book, he's been living there many uh, decades. And uh, we're told then at the start of this chapter, that it's now the first year of King Darius. Well, Darius is the guy who successfully conquered Babylon. Uh, whilst Daniel was living there. So he would, they were conquered by the Babylonians, but the Babylonians themselves were conquered. So the Babylonian Empire is now the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And so we're told it's the first year of King Darius's reign. That means it's not long since the city was attacked and taken by Darius. So this is a very turbulent time in history. Daniel is living through these different empires vying for power it could easily be a, a worrying time an unsettling time but actually none of this would have taken daniel himself by surprise because again and again through this book of daniel daniel's been shown in, in different ways god really predicting that this was going to happen this rise and, and fall of, of empires there was a a dream uh, in chapter two of a, a statue, this vision of beasts in chapter seven, and both of those were about changing empires. 
Uh, he was told very specifically in the vision in chapter 8 that the Medes and the Persians were going to conquer the Babylonian Empire. And in fact, uh, on the very, very night when it happened, when the Babylonian Empire fell, well, Daniel was the one that interpreted the writing on the wall in chapter 5. So it's not a great surprise to Daniel that Darius is now in charge. But it must have still been a little bit unsettling. Just as he's got used to living under the rule of one brutal empire, uh, along comes another one. And so that's the historical setting to this prayer, a time of great upheaval, perhaps of fear for a lot of people. Maybe a time not unlike our own, when, when everything is changing. Just don't know what, what does the future hold. But of course, Daniel himself doesn't seem too phased by the comings and goings in the city of Babylon. Instead, we see in verse 2 that his eyes are actually on another city altogether, Jerusalem. We're told he's been reading the writings of the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, he'd actually sent a letter from Jerusalem to the exiles after they'd been taken captive. And it was a letter that brought God's message to them and what they were to do now that they're in, in Babylon. And if you're interested, you can read what the letter said for yourself in Jeremiah 29. But uh, the gist of it is that they were to prepare themselves to live a long time in Babylon, to settle, to plant crops, to, to marry, that it was very clear this is not a short-term thing this is going to be a while that you're in this city but then the letter says after 70 years things were going to change let me just uh, read uh, a few verses from the from the chapter uh, starting at verse uh, 10 this is from jeremiah 29 for thus says the lord when 70 years are completed for babylon i will visit you and i will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So Daniel is possibly reading this letter from Jeremiah, telling the exiles, firstly, to accept the fact they're going to be in Babylon for a while. They're not to think they're only there a few years. They're even told to, to pray for the nation which has taken them captive, but that they're very clearly, once 70 years have gone by, which is basically a, a lifetime by ancient world standards, once a whole new generation, maybe two new generations have grown up, then the Lord is going to fulfill his promise to bring them back. They're not going to be in Babylon forever. It's not the end for the Jewish nation. It's not the end for the fulfillment of all those promises made to that nation over the years. They will return. God's going to give them a future and a hope. And they're told at that point to seek the Lord, to call upon him, and that he will hear if they seek him. They will find him. He will bring them back. So something like that is probably what Daniel is uh, reading. And, uh, and of course, by this point in history, Daniel has been in Babylon a long time. Daniel is, by this point, probably in his late 80s, early 90s, uh, age-wise. And so Daniel is doing his sums, and he's working back. Just how long has it been? 70 years. It's nearly up. So what does he do? He's heard the promise from God. How does he respond? Well, of course, he responds in the way that Jeremiah had instructed. He seeks God. Now, we might wonder, well, why does he bother? After all, God has promised this is what is going to happen. Daniel knows full well, well God keeps his promises. He's seen that already in the fulfillment of some of the visions uh, about those empires and things like that. So why not just kind of kick back? Let's wait for this to happen. Why pray in response? Well, of course, one answer is because that's what Jeremiah said to do. But it's also important to just to make the point here that actually that the sovereignty of God, the certainty of his promises, is not a reason not to pray. 
Daniel understands God's promises. He seems to really believe in what God can do. He's he's hoping for that return to Jerusalem. And yet still he prays, he cries out to God. And I think too often as Christians, our confidence in God's promises and his his sovereignty, sometimes it can actually kind of push out our, our prayer life. We think, well, well, God's in control. Can't change what he's going to do anyway. What's the point in praying about it? And we've got all these promises that God has made to us. Just try and think about some of them. He promises us eternal life in, in Jesus Christ, this unimaginable glory that's awaiting us, this sure and certain hope. He's promised us this, this place of being with God in a place that's free from pain, free from uh, death, free from sin. He promises this in the meantime, that the Holy Spirit dwelling within us now, bringing life to us even now, bringing us into the very presence of God. He promises that he's going to provide for our, our needs in this life. He says we don't need to be worried or anxious. He promises us joy and, and peace in Jesus Christ, even when things are hard. He promises us that nothing can separate us from him. He promises us that, that even difficulties, they can work for our good and do work for our good. He promises us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms and that he's going to pour out such blessing on his people that we're going to overflow blessing to others and so there's all these these blessings these promises that god has made to us and some christians perhaps they, they look at all of this and they think well well i don't need to pray then you know, god's got it all in control but actually the certainty of god's promises they shouldn't push prayer out they should actually spur them on and fuel them think about uh, other situations where a promise ha has been made think about for example when a a young couple get engaged well they're making a promise aren't they a promise to each other they're going to get married and uh, initially when they get to that date they're going to get married at whatever date it is so what does this newly engaged couple do next do they just kind of ignore each other and get on with their separate lives until the big day after all, the, the promise has been made, the ring's on the finger. Uh, why not just uh, live separate lives until then? Because that's not what happens, is it? I instead, that promise that's been made, it just dominates their conversation. They're looking forward to it. They're making plans. They're, they're reinforcing one another's commitment to that promise. And so when God makes promises to us, they're not meant to kind of nullify our relationship with him. They're not meant to push our prayers to the sidelines. Instead, they fuel our prayers. Daniel looked to that promise of a return from exile, and it is dominating his thought life, and it pushes him to pray. Uh, as he prays, he reminds God of his covenant. We see that in uh, verse uh, 4. Uh, and so for us, as we think of all these promises made to us in Jesus Christ, we shouldn't hear them and think, well, there's no point praying. I don't think many people would say that. Perhaps our behavior ends up behaving like that. Instead, we hear these promises and then we joyfully pray in line with them. We, we delight in our God as we look forward to the day when we will dwell with him. We, we pray for our needs, joyfully knowing that he, he will provide. We pray about hardship, knowing that he is in control. And if we pray in line with what God has promised, well, we can be sure of a positive answer. And when we pray like this, it's not because God's forgetful, not that he's forgotten his promises. It's not that uh, it's actually more that, that, that we are forgetful and we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded to look to these promises of the confidence that we can have in our God and really where it is that our help is coming from. And actually, we're often called to pray for things which God has told us he will do. So think of, of Jesus. He, he tells us very clearly that we're, we're not to be anxious about things like what we will eat or what we will wear. He says God knows our needs. He will provide. But then when he teaches us to pray, he says, he says to pray, give us this day our daily bread. So he says God's going to provide on the one hand, but we're also to ask him similarly we know jesus is coming back and that's a certainty but when jesus teaches us to pray he says pray your kingdom come your will be done 
think of uh, also the apostle john at the end of the book of revelation he sees that great vision of that kingdom coming and then he prays amen come lord jesus so these these promises these certainties that we have they're to fuel our prayers they're not to make them null and void so are god's promises are they fueling your prayer life as you face a trial are you reminding yourself of all these promises that god has made to you and, and when you are praying to this all-powerful god are you laying out just who he is and what he has promised to you and his people so that's are your prayers in line with those promises so that's the kind of prayer that that we're going to see answered in wonderful ways that's the kind of prayer that's going to uplift us and and spur us on we're to pray with promise so that's the first thing about prayer i think we see here that uh, we pray with promise god's promise us great things in the gospel uh, and they should fuel and inspire our prayers just as daniel looks to those promises and then he prays but the second thing i want us to notice about prayer from this chapter is that we pray with humility on discovering or reminding himself of the promise about the 70 years daniel turns to the lord in verse three we're told in sackcloth and ashes now this uh, isn't a fashion tip from daniel uh, this is a, a way that uh, people of course humble themselves before god in the ancient world sackcloth and ashes we're told that he's also fasting daniel isn't coming to god arrogantly making his demands saying hey god you made these promises now it's your time to deliver and he's coming with great humility to an all-powerful god and just as a bit of an aside point notice that his humility is shown in these very physical actions sackcloth and ashes fasting it's often said that it's not the position of the body that's important in prayer whether we're on our knees or, or lying down or whatever it is it, it's the position of our hearts are we humble before god in our hearts and i think there's that, that's true somebody can be on their knees in prayer but actually very far from god in their hearts but i don't think in saying that we should go too far the other way and completely downplay the fact that we are physical beings and that often the attitude of our hearts can follow or at least be influenced by the actions of our body and vice versa so many people do find fasting for example a good way to remind them of their humility before god their dependence on god for his provision can sometimes help people to pray more seriously for a period of time similarly some people do find it helpful to pray on their knees now let me clear i'm not of course we can pray lying down standing up we can pray whenever or wherever we are that's the wonderful thing uh, about our, our access to god but often a very physical thing like getting on our knees can be just a physical reminder of our status before God, that he is God and we are not. It's just a, a bit of a, an aside, but having humbled himself in this very physical way in verse four, now Daniel begins to pray. And this uh, theme of humility continues. He addresses God as the awesome God who keeps his covenant love. There is this awareness, isn't there, of who God is. That word awesome, it's pretty uh, overused these days. Everything seems to be awesome nowadays. In fact, there's a song, if you know it, to confirm it, that everything is awesome. But of course, when Daniel says God is awesome, he doesn't mean it in, in a kind of a flippant, everything is awesome kind of a way. It means it in a deeply profound way. Our response to God should literally be awe. When you are in awe of something, it's something that, that stops you in your tracks, isn't it? Something that you can't stop thinking about. Something that totally amazes you, that profoundly impacts you. And God is worthy of that kind of awe. He's the creator and the sustainer of all life. He is holy. He is pure. He is good and loving in ways which we can't begin to comprehend and we can by by grace approach this god know this god be a part of, of this god's family call him our father but we mustn't lose sight in the midst of this grace of the fact that, that god is awesome 
in a very profound way. And we need to get that perspective on ourselves. Our world likes to think everyone is awesome. Of course, as we read on, we see Daniel has a very different take. Daniel says, verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong. I'm sure you noticed as we read the prayer that really this prayer is primarily a confession, isn't it? It's an admission that the people have fallen short, that what God did when he had sent them into exile, actually that was entirely justified. Daniel isn't making excuses, he is confessing. We live in a world where a guilt uh, is often seen as something to be kind of shunned and ignored. We're told guiltily is something bad that we should think positive, boost our self-esteem and our ego. And whilst it's true that uh, guilt is a, a negative emotion, in a sense, it can tear us apart. Uh, and of course, there is such a thing as, as misplaced guilt. But generally, that the solution to guilt is not simply to ignore it, not to make excuses, not to blame the parents or the genetics or whatever else. Of course, those things can influence our behavior, but ultimately we need to bear responsibility for our own actions. We need to recognize when we are in the wrong and not simply to make excuses. We need to be real about sin, about its danger, its ugliness. We need to see that actually we really don't deserve to approach this God in and of ourselves. The solution to guilt is not ignoring it, but confessing it and turning to this God of grace for forgiveness. And of course, that's what the bulk of this prayer is all about. But I want you to notice as, we, as we've read it that he doesn't say, I have sinned or they have sinned. All the way through this prayer, he says, we have sinned. Daniel, who is really, if you read the book of Daniel, he's seemingly this, this model believer. He is one of the few Bible characters that we don't hear a bad word said about. But Daniel includes himself in this confession. This is a prayer of confession for the people of Israel. And even though Daniel himself, he may not have been directly involved in each individual transgression. He sees that as a part of this rebellious people, that he too bears responsibility. We've got such an, an individualistic mindset in the West that really we would probably never even think of confessing sin in a, in a collective way like that. The idea of any kind of collective responsibility, that's, that's kind of forgotten all about. Some might confess their own personal sin. Or we might look on with sorrow at the sins of others. But it's not very often that we'd hear this, this collective idea in, in confession, that as a church, perhaps we need to confess some sin or other together. It might be things that actually you've not been directly involved in, but maybe indirectly, we've allowed them to go on. Maybe when we look at our nation, do we bear collective responsibility for some of the ills and evils that go on? Or do do we instead just kind of judgmentally uh, look on uh, at others, look down on them and think, well, that's their problem? Or even as a human race, do we confess how all have sinned and turn away from God? And do we bear some responsibility for the many evils that go on in our world? Now, Daniel isn't a priest or a king. He doesn't have that kind of authoritative position which might cause him to pray in this way on behalf of the nation. He's not at this point standing before a great congregation as he prays like this. You know, might think, oh, maybe that's why he's praying like this. But still, he feels the need to bear that responsibility to confess not just his own sins, but the sins of his people and to include himself in that collective responsibility let's just let's not fall let's not kind of fall for that proud individualism of our modern era let's see ourselves particularly as a church as profoundly connected to each other responsible for each other well as i said daniel is not making excuses in this prayer and again again he recognizes god is in the right he acknowledges how the people haven't listened to the prophets in verse six he acknowledges the shame that they now face it's totally justified verse seven lord you are righteous we are covered with shame 
again, verse eight, we are covered with shame. Just imagine the shame that the people had experienced. They, they'd been sent into exile in a faraway land. Just imagine every Jew, each time they're seen in these foreign lands at that point in history, they were being asked, well, what are you doing here? And what's the answer? Well, the answer is I'm here because God's punishing our nation. We rebelled against our God. Very public shaming, isn't it? And Daniel says we deserved it. The people rejected God. They'd rejected his laws, rejected his prophets. And so Daniel cries out for his people and for himself. Now, Daniel's situation here, of course, is, is unique. I'm not saying that our, our present trouble now with this coronavirus outbreak, that it's a, a specific judgment on specific sins in the same way that this situation is. But of course, disease is a result of living in a fallen world, isn't it? In a more general sense, we could say, well, it is a result of sin, not in individual cases way, but in a general sense of the human race. And rather than kind of shout at God about it, maybe we need to be humbly asking, well, well, what is this awesome God telling us through something like this? How might this disaster be pointing us to him and reminding us of the mess that we've made of his world? How might we bear collective responsibility in that? And at all times, our prayer needs to involve this, this kind of humility, this openness about sin, this awareness of, of who we're talking to. And even as believers, we need to have this, this daily habit of, of confession, of, of humbling ourselves before God. Now, I might say, well, I'm righteous in Christ. And of course we are. But having that habit of confession reminds us just why we need Christ. How glorious a thing our, confession, our, our forgiveness is. And of course, that's how Jesus taught us to pray as well. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We need to take sin seriously in our lives and in our prayers. And we need to pray with this sort of humility to recognize who God is, who we are, to put, lay our sin before him. I keep getting a, a ding dong from somewhere of the thing. I'm not sure who it is. Well, finally, uh, we see in this chapter, we've talked about praying with promise, praying with uh, humility. Uh, finally, we see that we can pray with uh, confidence. Uh, having confessed at, at length the sins of the people, uh, as we read on from verse 15 onwards, Daniel now puts out his request. He says, let your anger turn away from Jerusalem, verse 16. He's praying, isn't he, for that return from exile that was promised. But how can he be confident as he prays to this God as part of such a sinful people? Well, his, his confidence, of course, is coming not from himself or from how brilliant his people are, but from God. Verse 16, he prays according to all your righteous acts. It's according to God and, and who God is, everything that he's done in the past. And in verse 18, he, he makes it clear, doesn't he? We do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness but because of your great mercy. Daniel's confidence is not based on, on who he is, or who his people are, but on who God is. And it's the fact that this awesome God has attached himself to this people that he pleads with God from verse 19. Lord, hear and act for your sake, my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. How can we be confident as we approach this awesomely holy God. Well, it's not about how good we are, how many times we've prayed this week, how many people we've shared the gospel with, how many meetings we've attended over Zoom. No, our, our only confidence before this God is the truth of who God himself is. It's his mercy that gives us confidence. It's his saving grace, his work of salvation. It's the fact that he's placed his Holy Spirit within his people. For the glory of his name, we pray. So don't pray confidently because you think God owes you something or because you think like some L'Oreal advert, you know, you're worth it. No, pray with confidence because, because God is God, because he's merciful and good and his name will be glorified uh, among his people. If you think God owes you something, you need to think again. No, your only plea 
is his abundant mercy, the promises we talked about earlier that he's made to those who call upon his name. And as we read on, of course, we see that Daniel's confidence was not misplaced. His prayer has been heard. While he's still praying, uh, we, he, Daniel has his visit from a remarkable being, the angel Gabriel. And I love what the angel Gabriel says in verse 23. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are highly esteemed. Even as Daniel started praying, God had already heard him. God hears our prayers. And we get used to that fact, but it should constantly fill us with wonder that this awesome, powerful, majestic God, the one that rules and sustains the universe, the one that, that he that holds all things together, he turns his ear to listen when we draw near in prayer and that even as our prayers go out he hears and he answers we can have confidence in prayer and the remainder of the chapter that uh, we didn't read the whole thing it's a vision from god which daniel is presented with in response to his plea now we're not going to i didn't want to dig into all the details of that vision this morning i think it's talking about what's going to happen in the following centuries from daniel's time but uh, if you just want to glance at verse 24 that kind of gives you the big idea that god's going to finish transgression he's going to put an end to sin he's going to atone for for wickedness bring in this everlasting righteousness and then seal up vision and prophecy to anoint the most uh, holy place or, or holy uh, one and according to verse 25, it's all going to begin after Jerusalem, Jerusalem begins to be rebuilt. In other words, God's going to keep his promises. Daniel's prayer has been heard. The people will return to the city. And it's uh, not long after this, if you know your history, that uh, King Cyrus of Persia, he then issues a decree for the exiles to return. But not only are they going to go back to Jerusalem, God is going to deal with that bigger problem that Daniel had prayed so passionately about that through jesus christ his holy one he is going to put an end to sin he's going to bring in this everlasting righteousness this everlasting kingdom there will be a day when there are no more exiles because of sin just everlasting joy of knowing and walking with god daniel could pray with confidence his prayer was heard so do you pray with confidence do you know that God hears our prayers and that often he answers even as we're still praying, setting things in motion. He knows what we need even better than we do. And ultimately his plans, they are our good plans. He will deal with sin through Jesus Christ, bring us to this glorious hope. Well, let me summarize as we close. How, how do we pray according to Daniel 9, this great uh, prayer of the Bible. Well, we pray with promise, clinging on to what God has promised us in his word through Christ, uh, reminding ourselves those promises, uh, allowing them to fuel our prayers. We pray with humility, recognizing just who God is and just who we are, confessing our sin. And finally, we pray with confidence, looking to his mercy to us in Christ and the fact that he hears our prayers and that he has power to act and he will bring about his plans for eternity and of course god knows it all he knows the end from the beginning he knows what we're going to ask before we ask him he, he knows what he's promised he knows of course all about this present situation with the coronavirus but th but that doesn't mean that we don't pray and we're called to cry out to him to draw near to him confess our need of of his salvation and to bring our daily needs before him it's a blessing isn't it to be able to pray to a god like this that delights to hear and to answer our prayers amen well let me pray for us before we sing our, our closing song there is a day uh, which i'll talk about in a moment but so let me pray for us just to as we think about prayer lord we do thank you for this reminder of the gift of prayer from the book of Daniel. We thank you for the many promises that we have in the gospel to cling to, to pray into, 
to be reminded of. Well, we pray that in the coming weeks and months throughout this, uh, this great uh, disaster, this pandemic, well, we, we would cling to those promises and remind ourselves of, the, of them and that they would push us to prayer, to cry out to you in humility, in confession, knowing that you hear us. Lord, give us this, this humility and this confidence that we need as we draw near to you. Lord, perhaps for some here whose prayer life has been neglected, uh, perhaps for many of us whose prayer life could be better, we do pray that you would spur us on to look to these promises and to bring them to you and to know the goodness and blessing of this sweet fellowship with you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing uh, this. I think some people might know it's been around for a, a, a long time, uh, but uh, I kind of think this is quite a good way to learn some new songs. This is a song really all about the, the great final day. We talked about praying with promise and uh, this song, it looks to those great promises of Christ's return and uh, all the great things that are going to come uh, when that happens. It's been around a few years now and uh, some of you I expect will sing it at conferences and things like that. Um, or other churches maybe and uh, it's a great song there's uh, there's one line that some people find controversial one line says oh yeah it's just a general feeling of, of praise uh, if you don't like it just don't sing it that's fine or uh, but uh, yeah there is a day looking to that great day when Christ will return let me find the music Matt's got the words up there is a day Just waiting
I can't stop it. I think the song had a long, a long instrumental solo for a while after that. It's a great song uh, that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's got some great uh, reminders of that day when Christ returns. And what a wonderful thing to look to as we pray with promise, we go through a trial like this, that fact that one day uh, all our troubles will cease, that one day every tear will be taken away, that Christ is coming back. Uh, I thought I'd uh, just uh, close before we, uh, well, before we break up into smaller groups, just to chat and catch up. If I can, well, I'll try and do that myself in a moment. But um, it'd be good to <clears throat> just remind ourselves of that to wonderful words from uh, Daniel. Uh, well, not for, from the book of Daniel, from that angel. As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given. And if that doesn't spur us on to pray, knowing that God hears, and as soon as we begin to pray, he, he hears and he answers. Amen. Well, if I can unmute everybody. everybody. There we go. Adam, Adam. Adam. Yes, Adam. yes, yes, yes. Um, can I just remind on the 17th that we're meeting at 4 p.m.